say thank you very much. If you, look at, if you have a good look at the program, I think you might see that Karen uh, Hoylund and me are the only names mentioned in this in these A4 without the letters FSA. So I think it is a great honor to speak here uh, today and I thank uh, the organizers for the invitation to, uh, to speak at this conference. <coughs> Sorry. I guess I was invited because we started an ERC funded uh, project on the post Roman economic development of Northwestern continental Europe in Merovingian times. So uh, actually I'm going to speak about research that should take place and has not really taken place uh, yet. But um, we developed this research of course on the basis of a number of ideas that might be of interest to you. It is a topic that has been uh, discussed now for over a hundred years. Our main research question is, how did Northwestern Europe develop economically after the collapse of the Roman Empire, and more specifically, who were the agents of this development? In research, uh, in recent uh, years, substantial contributions were made by this debate by historians also using material culture. In their work, there's a common denominator, which is that elites are the agents of development. Elite demand determines the economic uh, future. This may be true for some parts, but is it true for Northern Gaul, a peripheral area of the Roman Empire that nevertheless formed the core of the Carolingian Empire several hundred years later? Northern Gaul was hit hard in late Roman times. It showed a ruined countryside already since the 3rd century, and towns had shrunk to small fortified settlements. The final blow to demand was delivered by the departure uh, of the emperor from Trier to Italy and the retreat of the Roman army. Northern Gaul was a backwater of the empire, but it got repopulated quite fast from the late 5th, 5th century on. Hundreds of cemeteries are now known in the region, like the Picardy, some of them being very large. Repopulation, however, is not evenly distributed over Northern Gaul, which we are analyzing now. Together with this repopulation, important changes in burial rites take place. One can see, I'm lagging behind, I guess, this is the Picardy with all the cemeteries, and the big ones, and uh, changes in burial rites take place. One can see many grave goods, referring to food and drink, the inhumation of the fully clothed person, a strong accent on gender differenti differentiation, and one wonders why that was the case, and this burial rite developed quickly in the northern parts of the former Roman Empire. One can conclude that next to the repopulation, considerable new investments took place in burial rites and probably in other life cycle rituals too. Lavi's burial, so is uh, our hypothesis, was however not a privilege um, of the happy few. It seems to be widely practiced in the countryside of Northern Gaul. What you see, when everything is right, is a 6th century boy's grave, one of many that you can show uh, in a rural settlement cemetery near Nijmegen in the Netherlands with a sword, a lance, a shield, glass and pottery vessels and a bronze basin. Looking at all the material in graves in Northern Gaul, one can for the moment conclude that huge quantities of weapons, pottery, glass vessels, jewelry, belts, bronze vessels, horse gear, etc. have been deposited in graves, mostly by the rural population. And many of these objects were not of local origin. Byzantine coins, cowrie shells, beads, garnets, belt elements came from the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, or the Baltic. So the rural population obviously possessed substantial amounts of material culture of high quality produced locally, regionally, or far away. They must have had access to the networks in which these objects circulated one way or another, and it is this one way or another, you cannot formulate a more simple research question than this one. Uh, uh, we are analyzing uh, the one way or another, and I got quite a lot of money for that. Uh. <laughs> so, 
So stay in the European Union. <laughs> the most used current model to explain this is the top-down prestige goods model. Here it is. Such as presented by Heiko Steuer. Kings and aristocrats exchange gifts among themselves or they take prestige items by force. Kings and aristocrats control craftspeople at their courts and aristocrats present gifts to their client members of the retinue, which must include, I guess, because this is mainly, it's not very sharp, or is it sharp? Because I'm using all the glasses. Because this is mainly about men, but I guess that these kings and aristocrats were also handing out uh, fancy dress items for the wives of these clients, etc., etc. So there's no room for women in this game. There's neither room for the unfree in this uh, scheme. There are no unfree people. Objects from far away were obtained through long-distance trade, and the agents of this long-distance trade in the uh, upper corner here uh, were in contact with the kings and aristocrats only. The free were blocked from this long-distance trade. The circulation of foreign objects is thus controlled by the elite. A similar model, more recently, has been uh, presented by my uh, co-Dutchman uh, Jolo Nikolai in his book The Splendor of Power, with the exception that long-distance trader, traders were also in contact with the free. These are the long-distance traders in this model. The big question is, how much elite control was there actually in the period 450-650 in Northern Gaul? when all this wealth was deposited in the graves by the rural population. I would say that one would need a fairly omnipresent aristocracy to control the mass circulation of all these fancy objects from the Mediterranean, Near East, India and the Baltic. In my view, this top-down prestige goods model is a theoret theoretical obstacle to a proper understanding of the economic development in Northern Gaul. Yet there is, a, there is yet another theoretical obstacle. It's the peasant mode of production, which holds that peasants are not inclined to produce more than is necessary for their basic needs, or in more economic terms, their marginal investments of labor are too large to produce a meaningful extra unit. Such extra units are only produced when there are outside incentives such as feudal lords demanding a rent or the market. Thus, in a peasant mode of production, there can be no economic growth. That only happens with a change over to a feudal mode of production, which you can read in a very big green book. <laughs> However, Eric Wolf's uh, explanation of peasant household economics might, pro might provide an important clue to what had happened uh, what, what can happen in the peasant mode of production. An important element of the basic needs is the ceremonial fund. They are the resources to live an acceptable social life even in small-scale communities. One would like to help out the neighbor when his harvest fails or give a big party when your daughter marries. So what happens when there are serious changes in the needs for a ceremonial fund? Changing ritual repertoires by the rural population may bring about quantitatively, because there are many of them, important changes in the demand that are difficult to conceptualize with current models of economic thinking on the post-Roman period, in which rural populations do not figure prominently. So is this actually what happened in the late 5th and the 6th century in Northern Gaul? So what we do is to reconsider the circulation of wealth in Northern Gaul and the role of various agents in this circulation. First of all, we have to create a proper database on Merovingian archaeology in Northern Gaul. You have nice maps where all the Anglo-Saxon cemeteries are, we don't have them. So to our frustration, such an overview does not exist, which is actually a conditio sine qua non for any explanation of Merovingian Northern Gaul. So creating this database, and this is just, uh, this, we are mapping all the sites, and it's uh, really in progress. Uh, each day there are new sites added to this map. We are, uh, and it costs a lot of time uh, and, and, and staff. Uh, 
we are also mapping the distribution of a number of indicators for the distribution of wealth, such as uh, exotic beats, and the people who are doing all this are in this uh, room uh, today. So uh, this is really in progress, but when we finished our mapping, probably the whole area is covered by dots, indicating that the whole area, that everyone has exotic beats from the Mediterranean and India. And if, if this fails, I'll just make the dots a little bit bigger. <laughs> Glass vessels, we are mapping all the glass vessels, and you can still read uh, catalog entries uh, in German like uh, Luxus der Wohlhaben, and uh, nearly everyone could have, could have this. And when they had it, they might not have put it in the grave. Uh, that's my other escape. But, uh, we are mapping brooches, these bow brooches, we find them in the smallest of cemeteries and smallest of settlements as well. And, Aaron Paul uh, on the corridor with us is mapping uh, Merovingian gold coins and he is filling in record 13,523 or something like that. There's gold everywhere in the landscape. But. So, if you are thinking about this, we have also, uh, when re reconsidering the circle of circulation of wealth, it is unavoidable to reflect again on the meaning of the most lavish burials we have in Northern Gaul. We have to understand why they are there. Is it the aristocracy that we are tackling uh, here? We are critically assessing the archaeological Pavlovian reaction that a lavish grave or the presence of gold is aristocratic. This interpretation is vested in the modern conceptualization of the individual, which also explains why we are frantically searching for the names of these persons. We want to see historically existing persons, preferably kings and queens. And here they are. Um, however, their historicity might not be that what was really important at the time of the burial. I always compare such graves with the lives of saints written in the early Middle Ages. If you read them and you think you know everything of the historical person, you missed the linguistic turn in historiography. Now, on the other hand, they are not entirely fictional. There is a social logic of the text, as Gabriele Spiegel has explained to us. Grace might be like saints' lives. They might not exactly represent the historical person, but will refer to some extent to the social conditions in which the burial took place. Literary theorists like the Dutchman Hans Bertens ask the following question. Into what position does a text a film, a rock video, or a commercial try to maneuver us through specific strategies of narration, specific shots, images, and other forms of representation. One could rephrase this in, uh, into what position does a grave or a burial right try to maneuver us through, or the public uh, present in those days, through specific strategies of narration, specific shots, images, and other forms of representation. So let's stick to the example of the lavish burial in cult places that you just saw. What has, in my view, been insufficiently considered is that these are almost exclusively women and children. There are very few rich men's graves in cult places. This is more important than referring to them as queens and to try to identify them. Women must have been crucial in the definition of the relation between groups and the supernatural world. Like it was Clovis' wife, who was crucial in his conversion to Christianity, whether that was true or representation. When we look at the burial, maybe you should not search for the truth, but for the representation behind it. In most cases, it fits the sociological of the text, which refer to an important aspect of Merovingian society that one does not encounter much in texts written by men, but we archaeologists can see it. As I always see, there is a lot of society outside texts. I would not be surprised that these, um, am I running, let's see what happens here. No. I would not be surprised that these lavish graves in cult places, which in the early days of Merovingian archaeology were considered a contradictio in terminis, are related to a change in the conceptualization of wealth and the development of 
the idea of treasure in heaven so brilliantly explained by Peter Brown. Interpreting these grace as those of kings, queens, and princes, and accepting that they are thus explained, is too simple and probably misses the essence of those barriers. If you map such grace in northern Gaul, I haven't got the right map now, but there's some examples here, the area where Levi's burial is common, um, you, will find, you will find out that, that, that there are relatively few. Actually, there are not many in each uh, generation up till now. We have to consider the fact that they are quite incidental and not a normal phenomenon that they might and that they might not point to an omnipresent uh, aristocracy. Finally, um, we are uh, considering the role of central places such as Roman towns and the new Vicky of the Meuse Valley, and we would like to understand production in Northern Gaul, two topics that I'm not discussing much uh, today. Now, I was invited on a conference on the Staffordshire War, so I would uh, yeah, these are the two topics that are. So, now back to the Staffordshire Hort, with the risk of commenting on it without too much uh, intimate knowledge, but you, I'm, I'm confident that you will tell me that. To interpret it, I would say that we should first and foremost consider that gold was probably much wider available in society than is often suggested. In the book, we encounter kings, bishops, and aristocrats again, but I would suggest to conclude a range of other agents, such as traders, peasants, goldsmiths, abbots of small minsters, etc. I don't know in England, but I would suggest that they all had a fairly direct ex access to gold and silver luxuries and coins. If we try to make an idea of the circulation of gold objects, I think I got a scheme like that. Um, if we try to make an idea of the circulation of gold objects, we can start at the moment where they were produced, on the top of the scheme. To do so, an influx of gold is necessary, whatever the form it might have. Then, the produced objects start to circulate, which might be a quite complicated affair. At some point, those objects get out of circulation, because they were deposited in a grave, were lost, or deposited in dry and wet conditions, as I just explained, um, or as a ritual gift, or they might enter a hoard, or they are directly recycled. The important term that should be in the slide is transformation. Uh, objects transform in their life cycle, not only in a physical sense, which is suggested by Cardinal. Uh, when things are added to the hilt, but also in relation to their social value and their imaginary value, which is the value which is related um, to the system of values and the system of uh, how people think that the world is operating. Moreover, we are, and we should discuss maybe that, we are dealing with composite artifacts. That is, when a warrior is wearing a sword with a belt, there is a sword and a hilt, with a hilt that you can change. There's a scabbard and there's a, there's, a, there's a belt. Each of these objects, when they are in the normal circulation, are handed over from father to son. You can separate, separate these things. You can give one son the scabbard, you can give another son the sword, you can the third son give the gold. So these composite artifacts play a very complicated role in the intergenerational exchange of such objects, and that must have taken place because in the Staffordshire Hall there are objects that are almost 100 years old. We have, of course, uh, to ask about horse, which just has been done brilliantly. Why they were created, when, by whom, and for what purposes? One type of hoard is that collected in the minsters that are popping up in the English landscape by right then. They might have a reliquiary, difficult word for me to pronounce, a chalice, a patina, and maybe even more gold and silver. So if you map hordes in England contemporary with the Staffordshire hoard, the minsters that existed by 675 should be put, put on the map as well. Some of the hordes were simply collected for the gold to be reduced in the production of new objects. There is nothing special about such hordes. 
they have a quite profane character. But what these objects uh, need is again a transformation. Um, robbing the objects from their previous social and imaginary values and reducing it exclusively to the third value, its material value. And this uh, might have been done by the act of destruction and fragmentation. And I'm actually suggesting to you that you, interpreting this literature more, you should forget about all these symbolic, uh, social, and other connections that the objects have in the other contexts. Using the other context to interpret the horde might be something that has some methodological uh, difficulties. Occasionally such a horde does not get into the melting pot. Maybe the Staffordshire horde is such a horde buried, as far as we know now, as far as I see, in a fairly insignificant place, but correct me uh, if I'm wrong, just before entering the melting pot. It might already be ideologically removed from the world of kings, bishops, and aristocrats, maybe to be turned into coins spreading out to the peasantry. Remember, not all gold is circulating in, circulating in their hands only. Using the interpretive framework of intact gold objects in their normal circulation, by this one, um, the deposition in a grave or in a wet or dry ritual deposition or in a church hoard to understand a collection of fragmented and broken objects might uh, mislead us to some extent. Whatever is the case. One thing is certain, the Staffordshire Hoard makes 7th century England much richer than it was and it makes England richer today as well. It will certainly enrich the debate on the early medieval societies on both sides of the channel and thank God, we have to go back, there is a tunnel which has no knowledge of Brexit debates. <laughs> <laughs>